Um, hi, everyone. I'm uh, really looking forward to this conversation. I have uh, Yossi Taguri, who is the uh, founder and head of MissingLink.ai. Um, I've really enjoyed getting to know Yossi over the past year. I think after this conversation, you'll know why. Um, but before we get into our conversation about um, how we're bringing software and services to life at, at Samsung Next, I wanted to do a quick poll of the room. Um, how many people here are in a startup of less than 10 people? All right, how about less than 50 people? Less than the Magic Dunbar 150? And people, more than 150 people in the company. All right, so we got some good context of who's in the room. Um, I wanted to ask another question. How many believe startups are really the ones that are going to create the future of software and services? Show of hands. All right, so we have some strong belief of the advantage of a, of a startup. And the innovator's dilemma answers why this is the case, why we have this belief. And our focus at Samsung Next is to really focus on those challenges that often cause innovator's dilemma. We operate like a startup within one of the world's largest companies. Um, and what we do is we meet innovators where they are to help build, grow, and scale their ideas. And we do that through four key disciplines, corporate venture, M&A, partnerships, and product development. I'm Travis Bogard. I lead our product development team here at Samsung Next. And a quick bit about me. I've spent most of my career at the birth of categories transitioning into mainstream, from the early stages of the internet and messaging to um, early speech interfaces and uh, smart speakers, wearables, um, and on-demand marketplaces. So for me, this is an opportunity to really think about how do you take all that startup experience and leverage it at a new scale. And so I, I think about this question why. Like any great product person, I start with this question of why. Why is the status quo the way it is? Why has the world been structured the way it is? Why, do, why did we all raise our hands with the certain belief of what we think the outcome will be and who will own it? And I look at that from a product perspective. Why do some companies succeed when others fail? Here you have Friendster, which was early in the social media um, game. It was growing like crazy, lost a lot of its users to uh, MySpace, which of course lost them to uh, Facebook. And of course they had seemingly the exact same idea at play, um, but one ultimately had a very different outcome. And why do, did 75% of venture-backed companies last year fail? And for those that succeed, why does it take so long for them to get to success? And I started to turn this product question into a question of the environments themselves. Why do certain environments tend to, on average, innovate and create more than others? We've all heard about the prototypical startup garage. Why is that the case? And yet, companies, the big companies, have the scale. Samsung, as an example, sold 370 million devices last year, a TV and 10 mobile phones a second. So the question ultimately became a belief that said, I believe we can take the best of both worlds, use this scale to actually improve startup success while not, uh, while not suffering from the, the advantages that, um, or losing the advantages a startup typically has had. And that's what we're trying to do here at Samsung Next is bring these best of both worlds, startup culture and scale together. So let me introduce Yossi to kick it off and explain his background. Hi, I'm, I'm Yossi Taguri. I, I'm uh, from Israel. I live in Tel Aviv. I'm 45. Um, I created a few things. Uh, some of them is Feed Me. If you're in, from the Valley and you remember food spotting, that was way before Instagram where you shot uh, <laughs> photos of dishes and read them. Uh, so that was it. We almost sold it to Google. Uh, Yalo, which I spent four years of my life and $8 million of investments of other people's money. Um, and, um, and lastly, you know, Missing Link AI. But I, I started really early on. When I was a kid, my father worked at a factory in Israel. And every Passover, we would get a gift. And in one year, it was a color TV, right? 
we could choose between two TVs, one of them with a remote and one without a remote. And the one with the remote, we needed to pay more money for it. And we didn't have the money, so we took the one without the remote. Now, you remember the times, it's actually, to switch a channel, you actually have to get up and press a button, right? <laughs> Not, doesn't happen a lot these days. But every Sunday, right after the news at 5, in 5.30, there was this amazing TV show, an American TV show called Whiz Kids. And that show blew my mind. It was a group of kids going on an adventure and solving it with a computer. And this is, I think, the first time I've ever seen a computer, right? And it, it blew my mind. I begged my father to buy me a computer. And eventually, he bought me this one, right? This one is the Commodore 64, right? The reason this computer exists is because Steve Jobs, who invented the Apple II, went to Commodore and said, why don't you uh, market this for me, sell this for me? And they said, we can do better. And they cloned it, they copied it. And this was an amazing computer, right? No mouse, no nothing. You plug it in to a machine, to a TV, and you have to write code. And notice there's two ports on the side. Most games use port number two. The problem with my machine was my port number two didn't go left. <laughs> Just imagine what it is to play Pac-Man without going left. You're getting to a really high level. And eventually, because I couldn't play any games, I started hacking it. I started taking other people's software, breaking it, and fixing it, and learning how to operate it. I remember that the first time I managed to create something, it was a little software I copied off a magazine, and it was a little sprite. I, it took me days to copy that code, and the sense of accomplishment, when you see that little sprite go over the screen, it's like, oh my god, it's winning. And I spent all my childhood in front of a really small black and white CRT TV with the Commodore 64, and I just created things out of nothing. Some of my friends knew how to create music, some knew how to paint. They created art. I created code. And for me, this is the exact same thing, like art. So I spent all my childhood uh, hacking and building, th building things. And, and to be clear, there's a picture of you looking at you, right? That's what yeah, it's, it's my mom. It's for my bar mitzvah. And she, you know, uh, yeah, it's a picture of me looking at me. Yeah. <laughs> so um, you know, our format here is we wanted to pro provide a little introduction. Um, and we were going to have a fireside chat, ask a few questions about Yossi's experience. And, um, talk then a little bit about what we're doing at Next um, at, a, at a tactical and detailed level, um, and then talk a little bit more about what Yossi's experience has been part of uh, the team. But the, the real idea that we've been exploring is how do we get the best of the startup culture at scale integrated together um, in one place? And so, um, Yossi, why don't you tell us a little bit about the startups that you were part of, maybe your last startup, and what that experience was like? So my last startup was um, uh, called Yalo. We had a very smart telephony system where we could flatten the world. You could uh, uh, take your phone, uh, replace the SIM, and still be available on your calls uh, everywhere in the world, right? Just on data. And we would transcribe those calls, and we would uh, get inside from, from the calls. We started this company with uh, half a million dollars of a seed investment. We had more uh, talent join. Um, eventually, we were forced by investors to change the company from a consumer-oriented company uh, to uh, an enterprise company. And this is something that is not easily done. We basically didn't have the DNA. We had two and a half million dollars in the bank. And we knew we are going to close the company a year from the moment that we started that transition. We simply didn't have that talent that was needed to jump that, that hurdle. Uh, but there are, you know, there is one thing that I think that every young entrepreneur do, don't, you know, know. What makes you fail the most? You have an idea, you want to build it, you assemble a team, maybe you get a little bit of seed funding and you say, now that I have the money, I'm going to create this amazing company. But then your investor starts calling you and starts to ask questions and he wants status reports and he wants to know 
what's going on with this money. You suddenly need to give full audit of all our financials every quarter. You need to attend board meetings. And sometimes those investors, they're, you know, they don't know a lot about your business. That's why they invested in you. But they're giving you advice. And some of that advice is not necessarily the best advice that you should get. And you end up spending a lot of time managing your relationship with your investors instead of investing with your customers and your product. And this is a very hard thing to do. And I think the thec second thing which is very hard to do, even if you have a signal and if you, if you have a company that starts to get traction, and this is the point where you need to push really hard and push forward, it's really hard to get the right talent to join you, right? Because you don't have enough money, you don't have enough funding, you're not big enough for that talent to actually uh, help you uh, uh, go to the next step. And this is some of the things that basically you don't know when you're starting a company and we, you have this amazing idea. I think the third thing is finding the right partners to build a company. This is something that you cannot predict. You actually have to go on a journey with people to understand are we on the same page? Are we, going to over, are we going to manage the hard times of building a company, which is very, very hard in small companies and in big companies. And there's no good way to know if we're going to be good partners. Yeah, and so you're, you're talking about the people, exactly who's yeah. part of this. And these are you know, some of the themes of, of, of the struggles of why companies who even have a great idea kind of fail to kind of get to that next stage. Yeah. One of the things you said the other day, you also mentioned um, the ratios, the, the makeup of the team. Yeah. You ended up in a state that was very different than what you kind of in retrospect should have probably been at that stage. What, yeah. Talk about that a little bit. I, I think most companies think that technology is the most important thing and technology is very, very important. And when you start a new company, a new startup, most of the company is tech, right? That's how it should be at start, right? You cannot start with marketing, you cannot start with sales, you have nothing. Um, and I think what most companies, when they start to get traction, forget is that they need to also invest in business. The right ratio for a company when it starts is almost 100% should be tech. But while, as you grow and as you get more traction, it should be half and half. And I think the most healthiest uh, ratio is one third engineering and two third is marketing and sales and support and all the other guys that don't write code, right? And while technology is important, I think uh, the customers don't care how the code is written behind the scenes. They want to get value, right? Uh, and it's really hard to sell value with just engineers. And I, th I see that a lot with companies that fail to understand that it's not just about technology, but it's mainly about business. And this is a very important thing. Yeah, it's uh, another thing I found in that journey is that um, there's these hard questions that you ultimately have to ask. One of the things that makes being a founder or an innovator really hard is you have to go out and say an idea over and over that generally the world doesn't believe is a good idea. That's what makes it innovative. But you have belief and faith that it's gonna be there. But a lot of people talk about that as actually a challenge, and it is a challenge, but it's actually far easier than the next challenge, which is how at the same time do you go and say, hey, maybe this idea is gonna fail. This is probably a bad idea for these 18 reasons. And um, being your own harsh critic in that process, and so that's actually harder, but the hardest thing is doing both those at the same time. Simultaneously walking that line of belief and faith in something people don't believe, but at the same time being the harshest critic and not having it negatively affect your culture and not having people spin out of control in the abyss of, hey, maybe we're right, um, it is gonna go down. So there's that balance. And so that sets the stage for a question I had for you, which is you're amazing at motivated teams. I see you pull people together and get people excited. How have you seen walking that balance? So I think the, the most important thing when you, when you recruit people to join your journey is actually you are creating a family, right? Uh, and as a founder, as an entrepreneur, I have um, responsibility for their well-being, right? Uh, I found that being super, super honest 
about everything that happens in the company is critical to the success of the company. And I'll give you, uh, I'll give you an example. In my previous company, we knew around nine months before we closed that we are going to close the company. We, kn we knew. This was the trajectory. All the numbers show that we are just burning money and we will not be able to succeed. We gathered every everybody and we just told them the truth, right? We said, feel free to go and look for another job. If you want help, we will help you. And you would be amazed. Nobody left. Everybody stayed. Up to the last month of the notice, nobody was even looking for a job. This was amazing. This was amazing to see. And I think even today, when we are uh, inside Samsung Next, everything that we do, all the numbers, all the data, everything maybe besides HR, which is quite sensitive, everything is open to everybody. So I think this is very important for also personal growth of, of, of other people. And if we don't take people you know, and, and help them and give them the, the ability to grow, uh, you won't get their full attention. The only thing that I require from people who join my team is commitment, right? I want you to think and sleep and eat the problem that we are working on. And without, this is not a nine to five <laughs> job. Cannot be done, cannot be done. And you have to be completely immersed in that problem that you're trying to solve. So it's, I, at the end of the day, it's all about people and how you take care of them. Uh, that makes sense. So one of the things you said uh, uh, just a little bit ago was you talked about the ratios. You talked a little bit about business. You also talked about the openness of the team. Talk to me a little bit about, or the, team, the, the audience here, about how you think about the, the role of the business perspective along with the technology perspective and how those fuse together. Yeah. So... Usually when I speak to young entrepreneurs uh, who wants to raise money, I always tell them if you can do without raising money, go for it. Because once we, he's, he's, <laughs> he's saying like this, yes. Because once you take the money, um, those investors sometimes you know, pull you aside and make you focus on the wrong thing. They will tell you, do not think about revenues. Think about getting more eyeballs to your product, right? Give it for free, don't care about revenues. For my experience, the only important thing is revenues, is paying customers. That's when you know that you are delivering real value. What is the value of free, right? If somebody is willing to pay you $5,000 a month, he sees value, right? People don't just give you money. And it's very easy, by the way, to neglect that and walk around it and give yourself a million excuses why Nobody would want, we're not ready, it's not mature enough. When in reality, when people recognize value, they're willing to pay, you just have to ask them. The first sell is the hardest, right? To go from zero to one is super hard. To go from one to 10 is much, much easier. You just have to do the first one. So what I ask every company that I see, you know, are you making revenues? And I'm hearing all sorts of excuses. This is not the right thing to do. The this is the most important thing. You have a business, it has to generate revenues. Then, when you go to raise your next round, you have a position of power, you have leverage, right? You have a trajectory of how things are going. If you don't sell, by the way, my previous company, we were negotiating selling the company and they said, okay, we're going to invest this money in the sell, we're gonna pay salaries for two years, when are we going to get the return back? And we didn't have any revenues to say, this is the trajectory, this is the point in time where you're going to get your money back. It was just, you know, waving hands. Awesome. So one of the things we wanted to do is make sure that everyone left with some detail of how we're actually thinking about and implementing this. How does this work in practice as we go through? And so I wanted to talk a little bit about how we see getting that best startup culture intersected with scale. Um, and so the way that we're doing it really gets down to the basic answer of how most software development organizations are built. I'm sure you've all heard about Agile and within that scrums. And the basic idea of a scrum is it's an empowering, self-organizing, cross-functional team that's making their own decisions. And the basic structure of a scrum is very different than the way most companies are organized, which tend to be tops down. And if you think about why that's always been the case, it's because the very nature of the products required it. 
If you were building hardware, you're building operations at scale, your even traditional business did require that type of structure to be in place in order to, to succeed and more importantly to scale. And what we started to see was that software changed that dynamic a bit. It allowed us to free ourselves of traditional uh, uh, um, organizational structure to actually take this idea that, that empowers and grows um, in a much greater way. And so that's what we've been thinking about at Samsung Next is how do we empower our teams to own their decisions and then provide the infrastructure to reach meaningful success faster. Um, and so I'll talk you through five of the key things that we, I think about as we're sort of building these teams um, out and getting to these best of both worlds. So the first is this uh, idea of tribes and squads that Spotify uh, popularized. Um, when done well, it ultimately empowers smart people to be at the edge collaborating in a very unique way to find their best answer quickly. So that's one key piece. Tribes and squads are ultimately enabled by strong, passionate product leaders that think cross-functionally. They think from the business side all the way to the technology side, and how do you balance those together? They are typically hold roles called CEO um, in, a, in a smaller company. In bigger companies, they're PMs, they're product leaders. But every day, they're passionate about their idea. There's someone like Yossi who wakes up excited and knows how to go galvanize a team around solving a very hard problem and getting to meaningful value. You couple that with functional experts. Yossi mentioned earlier that one of the big challenges is how do you actually get the right expertise into the room and how do you even know what that expertise looks like? What does the very best of design look like? How do you think about design, not as pixel pushers at the end, but at the early stages of the development process? How is marketing actually answering the question of who is the customer going after to influence the product we're building, not just market the thing that we're trying to go, that we've already built? And so that functional expertise raises the bar, but they also know how to step back. They know how to basically say, squad, you go own your domain and go do it and make your decisions. The third thing, uh, fourth thing is uh, OKRs and first principles. The OKRs allow us to be aspirational, really set the direction of where we're trying to go and drive alignment across the team. And with first principles, we get to a place where we know how decisions are made because we're aligned. We don't need the top involved in every decision because the team's empowered and is going to make it the same way we would have if we were in the seat at that moment in time with all the data right at the edge. And then lastly, it all comes back to the product, which is you've heard this idea of minimum viable product. We think in terms of simple because we're trying to get to the signal that we can understand the fastest Loved because it's not about something that's just viable, it's about something that's really going to thrive in the world. And complete because it's about knowing that once we have that signal, we can throw gas on it and that fire is going to go very fast. So that simple love complete is a key, key thing that we think about. So with this as context of how we've been building the org, you'll see I'd love you to sort of think about uh, or talk about what your experience has been as part of Samsung Next, but yeah. before we get into that, yeah. maybe say a quick explanation of what Missing Link is. is. <laughs> yeah. uh, in, in my previous company, uh, we had this telephony system where we had all the audio coming through us. And we looked at the data and we asked ourselves, can we look into the future, 30 minutes into the future, and understand and, and maybe infer what would be the result of that call, right? And we're engineers. We're not data scientists. And by complete mistake, we stumbled upon this amazing technology which is AI. It's, you probably heard about machine learning and specifically deep learning. And looking at this technology, this amazing technology that is able to learn how to solve hard problems by looking at data, not at code. If you think on how engineers' mind work, they take a big problem, they break it down to smaller program, and they just write code to solve it. And this technology doesn't require almost any code, right? Think about what makes a cat a cat if I would need to build an application that identifies cats in pictures, right? It has a round head, pointy ears. We know how to write algorithms that looks for those uh, um, uh, 
um, uh, parts. Parts, yes. But here is a machine that, just by looking on millions of cat's pictures, can understand what is a cat and what is not a cat without writing code. And when we approached this and we started working on this, I felt like I was walking back on a Commodore 64. It was the most cutting edge technology, but I was doing command line. I was parsing logs. I was SSHing into machines. I said, I'm, I'm, that's not how I'm used to building software. I'm, using, I'm used to running really fast. I'm committing my code. There's a build server. It, it runs it, it builds it, it tests it. It puts it back in production. If something is going down, there's another system that makes it go back up. I'm using to automate. I'm, I'm used to be a lazy developer, right? And here, with the most cutting edge technology that can solve hard problems, I'm really working like on a Commodore 64. And I said, I think that in the next five years, every engineer, if he wants to be called a full stack engineer, would have to know what deep learning is. But I, I think that it's completely unacceptable to walk in a command line and work with practices of 30 years old uh, that we're used to. So instead, what we're doing with Missing Link AI, we're bringing best practices from the software development world that is fully automated, that runs very fast, to data science, which is the most cutting edge part that really is going to accelerate every aspect, every experience of our lives, from autonomous cars to even appointments with doctors, right? You are going to be assisted with a computer that is going to look on your scan, and it's going to look on one pixel and say, in five years from now, this is going to be a tumor. I strongly believe, by the way, that we are going to live much longer, not because of better medicine, but because of uh, early detection and seeing what some of our customers do today with CT scans and baby monitoring would give you goosebumps. This is science fiction and it's happening right now. And our aim is actually to accelerate that adoption of that amazing technology. Uh, so that's in 30 <laughs> seconds what we do with Missing Name. Passionate, right? Um, yeah. So I, um, ta in the remaining time here, why don't you explain what you've been able to do as part of Samsung yeah. Next that, that wouldn't have been possible as a separate uh, startup? Yeah, so we, we, we joined Samsung Next. We got to a point where we had this idea. I interviewed like 40 uh, customers in Israel saying, did I do something wrong how I did it in my previous company? And they all said, no, you did just right. And I said, don't you feel, find it a bit odd? So what if I, I solve that for you? Would you be willing to pay? And they said, yes. I said, how much? And they said, between $1,000 and $5,000. I said, that's interesting. I, I'm, I, I think I'm going to build it. And I wrote one pager answering one hard question, is why now? This is the most, it's really easy to walk around this as an entrepreneur, but if you can answer this, you're onto something really, really big. So we joined um, uh, Samsung Next, uh, and they gave us funding. And after eight weeks, we were out with one product, and we started iterating, right? The most important part is actually get that product out to customers. And after 14 months, we flipped the switch, and we had paying customers. That was, the, I think, one of the most anxious days of my life, because I didn't know, right? You, you want to believe that they will pay, but once you see the first contract signed, and the second, and the third, you know you're onto something. But at that point, you need to start scaling and scaling fast. So we had two options. One, we can go and raise more funds and try to build that company. Again, we were only five people, right? Or join Samsung Next, where we have access to amazing talent. And this is something that is really hard for us to do from Tel Aviv. We, we get to work today with Dane, who ran uh, design at eBay. He, he managed hundreds of people at eBay, and I get to work with him on a day-to-day -day basis. Or Ben, who is a completely different background. He designed electrical scooters, right? And Nick, who's a, an amazing storyteller, and Tarek, who is, uh, was a, a, a key PMM for, for Jira and Atlassian, which is a company we love and adore. 
Uh, and this is the kind of talent that I get to work with only thanks to the situation or the product team that we're part of that I don't think, I told you that even if I would raise $20 million, I don't think I could have run in the pace that we are running right now with the kind of talent that we have. Awesome. Well, I know we're coming up on time here, and this has been uh, super great, EOC. Um, if anyone wants to continue the conversation, come by our booth. We're sitting in the back over here. We also have a, a session right after this. If you're interested in deep learning to learn how to get going, be one of those full stack engineers that EOC talks about. And tomorrow we're doing a session on uh, collaborative spatial uh, computing. So um, thank you. Thank you very much.